Hi guys, once again. Um, so what we just covered was um, mapping to a reference genome. So that's when you have a reference existing. You're trying to take your reads and see how they compare to it. Um, but this talk that we're going to actually go over is what if you have no reference at all and you're trying to reconstruct your genome um, from short reads or just from scratch. So what is genome assembly to begin with? So say we take any genome of any species, for example, this is how it currently looks. We can see that we have a few repeats as well. When we do our sequencing, we end up reading smaller chunks of this original genome at different positions. And now the task in genome assembly is how do we take these individual reads and connect them again to construct our original genome, right? Doesn't seem too complicated when you initially start out, but it is actually quite a difficult um, computational problem. So the overview of this talk is going to be how assemblers actually work. Assembly algorithms for short and long reads. So short reads are examples of our Illumina sequencing, our paired end sequencing, which we had before. Long reads are our third generation sequencing technologies, so PacBio and Oxford Nanopore, um, which come with their own set of problems, which is why we have different assembly strategies. And then what makes short read assembly difficult to begin with? So the way whole genome shotgun sequencing works is we just start copying and fragmenting the DNA. What we ideally want to do is we want to make enough copies of our DNA and uh, fragment it in enough positions that we're able to cover every single one of these original sequences with enough coverage as well. So we capture all these sequences multiple times in different ones of these reads. What we then want to do is, assuming that we do get a large number of these fragments that almost all the genome positions are covered with, we want to be able to align them one after another based on their overlaps and try and see what kind of consensus sequence we can build by reading them at every given position. Um, but because we don't actually know where the reads came from and because we can have repeats in between, aligning them in that nice, neat format isn't always usually that simple. So one of the main categories or one of the main essential characteristics we need to have is coverage. For So coverage in this case, because somebody asked yesterday as well, between the difference between coverage and depth, um, the coverage is your average coverage of um, all the positions across the entire sequence, but coverage is also used for a given position as well. So in this case, we can see that the average coverage of our um, input sequence is about 7x, but if we focus on this G over here, it's only about 3x, about 4x, and so on and so forth. So the average coverage is just the average of each and every one of these bases. So basically the same thing. So in this case, they're referring to this T over here, which has a coverage of six. When you're doing assembly, you need to have enough coverage so that you can accurately call those bases at the end. The more similarity there is between any two of your reads, and for these purposes, you have to remember that we're comparing reads from our sequencer with other reads within that same sequencing <coughs> run, um, rather than to a reference. So everything's being compared one against another. The larger your similarity between two reads, the more likely they are to be one after another from the original sequence. Um, so in this case, we can see that if we align these two, we get this huge map um, for the first, I think, seven bases, a mismatch and another perfect map. So we can assume that these two came one after another if there isn't any other read that somehow spans between these two or has a greater uh, mapping between the two reads. Now, Depending on the kind of data you have, you get intrinsic problems with both. So long reads like PacBio and Oxford Nanopore, you get average read lengths that are just greater than 10 kilobases. Um, PacBio is pretty consistent with a mean average read length of 10 kilobases. Um, it's just very, very, very expensive. Uh, Nanopore, it depends on the chemistry, but ideally what they do is they target the chemistry to capture around 8 kb, so they get the most high throughput as well. The problem with both of these is your error rate just from the sequencing technology itself is about 5 to 15 percent um, being miscalled, a base being miscalled, or in a single insertion slash deletion happening at a given site. So the problem with this one is you have to overcome the high error rate by taking advantage of these huge reads that you end up gaining. 
With Illumina, you have very short, high accurate reads, um, but because you have such short reads, it's difficult to try and span large stretches of uh, repeats because there's no way of being able to determine which of these reads goes from either location. Um, so with short reads, efficient assembly is what the problem becomes. It's also high throughput. So remember that with Illumina, you can get up to like 600 million reads. You have to compare each one of these reads against each other to try and build your overall graph. So from a computational standpoint, it becomes much more difficult. So for each one of these, there's actually different assembly strategies that we end up going with. So for long read sequencing, we end up having this overlap layout consensus method. Um, and then we'll get to the short read as well because it has a different approach. Well, it is what it is. Um, so this is the general layout for a long read assembly pipeline. You take your reads, you overlap them one after another, you lay them out into large stretches where you get context, you take the consensus at every single base to get an accurate call of what those bases for the context might be, and then there's further steps you can do with the context afterwards. So your overlaps work exactly like how we were seeing before. You lay out your reads and you try and see what the largest suffix of one maps to the prefix of another read. Okay. So in this case, you can see that GG, C, T, C, and so forth over here matches perfectly to this prefix over here. So you know that this read precedes the second one over here from a computational one. And you do this across all of your reads to try and make a directed graph. So if we take this original string over here and we break up into small pieces, we get this directed graph where this connects up here, which also connects down here, which connects up here, but also goes over here. The numbers above illustrate the number of reads which end up giving support to that specific directed graph. Once you have this overlap graph constructed, we can now start doing layouts and try and resolve and simplify what our original graph is. So overlap graphs can end up looking like this. This is just a simple sentence of to everything, turn, 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 there is a season. The reason why this is used is because you have this repeat of turn, 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 which causes all of these ambiguous mismatching going back and forth. Um, so what's basically happened over here is you've taken the sentence, you've fragmented it into much smaller pieces, and then you've connected them up. What you do when you're laying them out is, so this is just a subset of the uh, graph, and you can see that this green node over here that connects to ever with every can also be represented by to ever, o every, every. So this branch over here is actually um, can be resolved by just taking the blue directed point so we can get rid of this green point over here, this green directed path. So we can actually simplify our graphs by getting rid of redundant steps that can be explained by other steps instead. Does that make sense? So. What we can basically do, in summary, is we can check if two nodes that are connected can be connected by an intermediate node in between. And that helps us get rid of some of these edges. So our graph from before now looks like this, which is a drastic improvement on what our overlap graph can be. Now we can further continue this by checking if any two nodes have two intermediate nodes that can explain it. And our graph ends up simplifying from that to this simple graph over here. We still have that unresolvable repeat in the middle, and there's no way of actually explaining any one of these by following this layout consensus or this layout strategy. Um, so because of that, this is as simple as our graph can end up being. Now we see that we have this long stretch of directed nodes, and this long stretch of directed nodes, and this unresolvable repeat. So with overlap layout consensus, what you end up doing is, in the second step of your layout, you end up taking this as contact one, taking this as contact two, and this is an ambiguous region. So you now have your long stretches of DNA, well, DNA your sub reads, that you can now continue with your assembly. Now with consensus, what you do is, because you know how each one of those fragments end up um, connecting to one another, you can align all of your reads that make up a specific contact, line them up, and then you call the consensus at that specific location. So the most common base that's called. In say this position over here, we see we have C, C, A, 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 because the A's are more common than the C's. I might be looking at the wrong position. Um, C, C, T, so it's actually shifted. So C, C, T, 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 
CC, sorry, uh, you end up calling the consensus of a C. I think the PDF is shifted to the side, or the PowerPoint shifted to the side. Yeah, yeah. So basically, two C's and three T's. That works as well. So as long as you, so basically, what you do is you take the majority you vote. Um, I believe it's, if it's a split decision, um, some assemblers will make that into a bubble, and then you can resolve that afterwards. Otherwise, it will take either one. Because, it's unre because you don't know what it actually is, you, it, it's a limitation of the program itself. Um, but then that's basically it. So once you have your larger context, you can then use those contexts as your reference assembly. There's no way of bridging ambiguous regions, um, not with just one sequencing technology. Now, with short read assembly, it's actually a fair bit different. You have this pre-step, which is error correction, which can sometimes be skipped. You have your graph construction, graph planning, then the contact assembly, and then you do scaffolding and gap filling. And gap filling is also sometimes an extra step as well that can be ignored. So error correction just works. But, so let me explain this in a bit further because it's actually explained in the next step. So what, the way you work with short read sequences is you take a sequence like this and you break it down into substrings called k-mers. So if I say I have a k-mer of 40, that means I read this string over here in 40 characters at a time. And I shift it one after another and I collect all the possible k-mers that exist within my sequencing file. So what you can actually do then is you can look at the number of times you see specific k-mers. If you get k-mers or if you get strings that result from just sequencing errors, which is what this position over here shows, because as your sequence or your reads get longer and longer, you get more error rates within every single base. You can get missed calls on what the base specifically is. So by counting the k-mers um, that might have resulted from sequencing artifacts and knowing that because sequencing artifacts are fairly low um, with short read sequencing, we can disregard all tiny k-mers and only focus on the larger ones. Um, once we have this subset of larger k-mers, we can then continue on to the next strategy. Um, you can also do inexact overlaps between the reads, but it's extremely slow because you have millions of reads that you're comparing. Um, and there's a bunch of programs that will end up doing k-mer based corrections as well. Once you have your subset of k-mers, yes? So, do you know what the Yes, so you actually select what your size of your k-mers are. It's a parameter that's given when you're running your assembly programs. So, you, so we'll get to that afterwards. Um, Jared actually wrote a program that'll help you decide what your best uh, k-mer contact is. But as, because assembly is not an exact science, um, you generally have to do multiple different k-mers and then try and see what gave you the best assembly. Um, so once you have your set of k-mers, you have the set of reads that you actually want to deal with, you can start doing your graph construction. So the way you do this is you end up taking your reads over here. So in this case, your reads are only six bases for ease of convenience. Your k-mer that you selected are four. You lay out all of your k-mers on a graph. And then using the reads, you see how each k-mer is connected to one another. So you can see that CCGT, CGTT will connect to each other. And then the next four strings is this one up here. So you see a connection up there. And you do this for every single read independently. and you build these graphs or these nodes that connect all of your cameras together. And you end up getting this initial um, graph layout where you can see that you have this long stretch that goes to ACGT and then loops back to CGTT and then you have this trailing end over here. The issue is you don't know whether your sequence is actually rep repeated multiple times because there's no way of resolving that, whether this might just be from sequencing artifacts, so on and so forth. So there's other problems that end up coming. Now this is just for, what is it, four, for five reads with six bases each. So the problem becomes much, much, much larger when you start looking at longer sequences or even more reads. So just like we saw before, sometimes when you end up doing your assembly layout, you end up getting these little artifacts that come off. They don't end up going anywhere. They just trail off and they're much shorter than the overall sequence as well. So those are called tips. So what you, in, so those are one source of error that you get from assembly with short read sequencing. The other thing you get is at positions where you might have a header, so you have a heterozygous position, you can get these little bubbles where you get this one k that results as one sequence and another k that results from another sequence. 
Because it's exactly that position, you get the exact same fragments going both ways. Or you get the exact same number of nodes going in either one of these bubbles. So our main problem then becomes, if this is our example of a graph layout, how do we end up cleaning this so that we can arrive at context that would work? So the first strategy is we look at all the tips that we have in this graph. Anything that's at the end, so any camera that's at the end of a node is considered a tip. So the very first and the very last of this longest sequence is also considered a tip. Then we work backwards until we arrive at the longest sequence. So because this is the first one and these are the last one, we can see a large number of connected nodes and a large number of connected nodes. And so we end up disregarding them as tips, but we've now highlighted all of these random branches that go nowhere. And so we remove those contents or those cameras from our graph. The other thing now we, that we have to deal with is these little bubbles that are formed. Because they're heterozygous positions and we don't necessarily know which one of these two options are the ones to follow, the program assigns. So once you know it's a full bubble and it's the exact same length, the program randomly picks either one. And so you end up getting one of your nodes resolved. Now, because you have these longer stretches of sequences now, with these positions over here being ambiguous, you can start building your context. And the program goes along and connects all these stretches of k-mers into your overall context assemblies. So once you have these contexts, you also want to be able to tell, because you're using paired-in sequencing, you have more information, you want to know how these contexts actually relate to each other and how they connect to one another as well. So that's where scaffolding ends up coming in. So what you end up doing is you take your context, and because you have paired-in information, you can check to see where the reads of this first contact or whether the reads of this first contact map to the reads of your second contact. In this case, the blue over here and the blue over here show that these two contacts are connected. The red over here and the red over here show that these two contacts are connected. The green over here and the green over here show that these two are connected. And that's supposed to be purple, so those two purples would also connect the last graph as well. Um, and because you have that, you know that the contacts or your overall sequence must have followed a pattern in this manner, where contact one, two, three, four, five are arranged in the sequence. You unfortunately don't know what's actually missing in between, uh, or what the base sequence is that's missing in between this, because they're usually from repeated sequences, and they could be anything. So what ends up happening is you fill them with ends for ambiguity, um, or because third generation sequencing is now available, where you can get 10 kilobase pair reads from a single um, fragment, you can use long read sequencing technology to try and see if you can bridge these gaps using um, PacBio or Oxford Nanopore. Or you can do local assemblies in this location to try and see whether you can somehow resolve them. Um, but that's basically the overview of the two different assembly strategies. There are hybrid assembly strategies now where you can pull your short read sequencing information and long read sequencing information and try and see if you can reconstruct a better assembly. Um, but those are still experimental um, and there's still work being put into it. So the quality of an assembly also matters a lot. Um, so bacterial genomes that are short reads, you get hundreds of contexts that are 10 to 100 kilobases. If you use long reads, you get a handful of contexts. And if your genome is small enough, you can actually just get one contact that sequences the entire genome. And if you give it enough depth, you don't actually need any error corrections or any short reads. You just get the entire sequence perfectly. Um, for larger genomes, our short reads give us about 10 kilobase pair contexts or a million base pair contexts for long read sequencing. But it's just far more expensive to do PacBio or Oxford Danapore than Illumina short read. Illumina costs about $1,000 or 1500 um, PacBio will give you a lot lower coverage and cost you about $10,000 to $15,000. So an order of 10 for a fraction of the coverage. Um, but because assembly is really important in terms of the way we've approached um, our new analysis of, say, for example, cancer genomes. So some cancer genomes that have larger structural variations, if we use our traditional mapping, um, our mapping strategies, we might be losing out information that otherwise would be resolved from the assembly just because we're forcing matches to occur against a normal deployed reference genome. Um, so there's been a lot of work put into assembly in that strategy as well to try and discover um, underlying differences in normal genomes or in mutated structurally varied genomes as well. So there's a competition called Assemblathon too, 
that, while well, it's hosted every single year, where different labs will come and compete to try and see which of their softwares is the best. So in 2013, they were given three different genomes to try and reconstruct and assemble. And what they ended up finding was that each one of their assemblies was actually quite varied. So there wasn't a consensus on whose assembly was actually true and whose was the best program to work with. Um, so Jared and so Jared's specialty is in assembly. Um, so he ended up trying to look at it and try and figure out, well, what kind of parameters from these assemblers could cause these differences, what makes a given assembly difficult, um, and also if you're comparing different species and the variability between species, what kind of um, problems might come up. And he ended up making a list of different um, factors that might make assembly difficult. So repetitive sequences are pretty obvious. It's kind of difficult to resolve what follow, which context follows from another one um, when you aren't able to fully go across it. High heterozygosity also makes it a problem because you don't you get a lot more bubbles in your graph and you don't know how to overcome your bubbles. You also have don't really have a specific reference sequence to go with. Low coverage makes it really difficult to try and determine whether you have a consensus sequence or not. Bias sequencing, so regions where you have high GC content might be um, sequenced with a greater depth than lower GC content, um, just because he uses it as well. So the plasmodium that ends up, that gives rise to malaria actually has AT content of about, about 80%. So it makes it very, very, very difficult to try and assemble because your coverage is really low and is extremely biased. But because it's malaria, there's still a lot of work put into it. So people are still trying to overcome these factors, but there's still problems. High error rates because you make random bubbles and chimeras, chimeric reads where part of it just doesn't map anywhere. Um, if you still have adapters inside your reads, this will cause problems because you're trying to force um, bases that don't actually exist in your organism. Uh, sample contamination, obviously. So like, they'll throw what you're trying to assemble off. And if you, have, if you sequence multiple individuals and you're trying to reconstruct a single assembly from these multiple individuals, well, you're causing heterozygosity to exist to begin with. So you're not actually able to reconstruct with efficiency. Um, so Jared ended up writing a program uh, to try and help overcome these, or try and help you estimate how difficult it is to, for, uh, for a given assembly or for any assembly that you're trying to approach. So this is the structure of a graph that you would have at the end of um, an initial graph construction with assembly uh, with short read sequences. So you can see that you have errors over here, snips and indults gives you the bubbles, and repeats give you these um, so sometimes the arrows are supposed to be pointed backwards, but you get this unresolved little repeat that just keeps going back and forth. So based on these different metrics, um, his program is able to determine whether your assembly is going to be easy, hard, how hard it might be, what the average or what your expected genome length is if you're doing organisms that aren't fully categorized. Um, and the way it does it is it looks at KMR coverage. So for every given KMR, how many reads contain that KMR? Um, just like we used error correction, we throw out really rare ones. We want to be able to conserve everything else. So a good assembly or something that would be an easily assembled genome would be something where you have a normal distribution of your KMERS. Um, this very, very, very small bit at the end, which is basically one, um, one KMER or two KMER counts, would be the rare heterozygote, uh, would be the rare KMERS that might have given, that might have come a right that might have arisen from sequencing artifacts, so you'd end up disregarding them anyways. Um, you can actually see that there's this little shoulder over here. So because it's a human uh, genome, we have about one in a thousand SNPs. So you have this little coverage over here of bubbles of KMERS that have half the, um, that have half the expected coverage, and that's just because it's a SNP position. So you, you get this little bias over here, but it's nothing that can't be overcome. Now, if you take something like the oyster genomes, the oyster genome actually has SNPs every 100 base pairs or so, so it's about 10 times more than humans, you can see that you have this bimodal distribution where you have ha some of your cameras still following that average coverage, but because you have such a high SNP rate, um, you get a much bigger portion that have about half the coverage. And this makes it much, much, much more difficult to try and resolve what your overall assembly would be. Um, the more biased your distributions become, the more difficult slash impossible it gets to, to try and reassemble it accurately. So 
once we have the coverage as well, we want to be able to take these different branch parameters and try and assess how difficult our assembly would be. And we can do this based on different models. So we can do error modeling, variant modeling, and repeat modeling. These are all different parameters and uh, mathematical models that Jared built. Um, so if you guys have questions on them, I can try to answer them, but I don't think I'd be able to. Um, but basically, the program that he's ended up writing will give you a set of figures, which will try and help explain any of these problems with it. So for a variant branch rate, this tries and tells you for different camera lengths down here, different camera lengths, how your frequency of variant branches in the Debrun graph um, occur. So if you have more, if you have higher heterozygote or variant branches, it makes it more difficult to try and assemble the genome. You can see that Oyster over here is about 100 um, frequency of variant branches, which kind of goes in with its every 100 base pair SNP rate. Humans are about 1 in 1,000. And then this yeast over here is used as a control because it's not supposed to have any variant branches. Um, you can also model your repeat branch rate to try and see the frequency of repeated branches based on different camers. Um, and you can see in this case that as your camers get longer, your repeat branch rate does begin to fall as well. Um, but because humans have a lot of long repeats in our genome, we are still higher than all the other organisms. Uh, these organisms were chosen um, based on the fact that the yeast is a control, uh, human, snake, and fish, I believe, were part of the assemblathon um, competition. Oyster is just used as the worst case scenario, and then the bird was just added in to, I guess, purple. Um, but the bird was also added in to try and compare against the other programs. Uh, what his program will also do is try and, based on the assembly graph that you give it, it'll try and estimate what your expected genome size is supposed to be. And the reason for this is, is you want to be able to have enough coverage for your expected genome size to be able to accurately resolve any repeats or call specific context. Um, so the program's accurate to about 10%, because you can see the human genome that it's estimated is almost 3 billion base pairs, which is roughly the length of a human genome, or the reference genome that we accept. Um, it'll also estimate the quality scores at every given base position. And you can see that as your base position as the base position gets longer, your quality scores begin to fall. Quality scores falling make it much more difficult to do your graph assembly because you have more of those branching effects and you have um, nodes that don't or shouldn't belong there at all. So what you would ideally want is something that's steady without any quality scores falling, but this is just a result of the sequencing technology itself. Um, and then you can also measure your error rate at any given position as well, and the higher your error rate becomes, the worse it'll be trying to assemble your genomes. So all of these are metrics to try and determine how difficult the set of sequences you just gave it is going to be to assemble. Um, the last thing you also want, or one of the last things you also want to check is GC bias. You don't want your KMR coverage to be based on percentage of GC. So what this ends up doing is plots a heat map, and you don't want any trends to be present. So for our fish, which doesn't have any GC bias, we can see that we have this singular point right in the middle without any trends. Um, if you look at the yeast genome, you can see that there's a bit of a linear trend that increasing GC concentrate, GC coverage or percentage actually causes a decrease in coverage, but it's slight. And then if we look at the oyster genome, because of that high SNP rate and heterozygosity, we actually get two of these position, uh, GC hotspots and we see a slight bias for GC in terms of KMR coverage as well. The program will also output um, the expected fragment size because you're using paired end reads, so you end up getting a nice distribution um, or an estimated distribution of your fragment size based on the reads. And I'll also do a simulated assembly. So since you were asking about um, what KMR to ideally choose, it spans across different KMRs and tries and gives you what your simulated length of N50 is, and we'll talk about N50 in the tutorial. It's one of the metrics we use to try and determine um, how good your assembly is. Um, so it helps you pick or focus on which KMRs to actually select when you finally run the assembly on your entire genome. Um, the program is called PreQC, is run and fast. So the, this is from I don't know if it's still a preprint, it might have been published for now, but the preprint is still available at this link, and the code 
to actually view how it does all of its um, metrics and calculations is also available on GitHub. And these are the commands that you basically have to run. So it's three commands and you end up getting a summary of your assembly strategy. So that's just an overview of how assembly, assemblers work. Um, short and long read assembly requires different methods because they're different data sets. You can't just use whichever strategy you want because they're tailored for that specific technique. Um, and many factors determine if an assembly is difficult or easy. Short reads, SGS, PreQC can help assess these factors. Um, but just, just because it can help assess the factors doesn't mean you can necessarily overcome those factors. Um, and the strategy nowadays is to pull short and long to try and create the best assembly poss possible. Um, and that's basically it. Any questions? Mm -hmm.